Uh, welcome to the session of Software Architecture A27. And in this session, we will have uh, five different papers. The first one is a journal first, and then we will have a demo paper, and then we will have an in practice, and then near, and then we'll finish with in practice. So I present myself. I'm Patrizio Pedicione, an associate professor professor at the University of L'Aquila in Italy, and I'm also associate professor at Chalmers University and Gothenburg University in Sweden. So, but now we can go with the, with the first presentation, that is um, a presentation that will be given as a video, but please make your questions because we will have the authors available for answering questions. And the title is about uh, what should your runtime configuration framework do to help developers? Hi everyone, my name is Mohamed and I am postdoc at Queen's University. Today I'm going to present my work about what should your runtime configuration framework do to help developers. Uh, configuration is actually a mechanism that allows users to change the behavior of the software system without touching the source code. For example, in Google Chrome, you can change the font size, you can customize your search engine, etc. However, other software systems tend to have much more configuration options. They have uh, hundreds of options that can be available on just a uh, textual file. For example, MySQL has hundreds of options that are just available in textual uh, file. And that leads to a lot of, a lot of uh, problems and configuration uh, errors. And in prior study, we found that developers face 22 challenges related to uh, the configuration uh, engineering process. Uh, some of those challenges are inherent challenges, like uh, adding options increase complexity. Uh, other challenges are technical. For example, uh, removing options is risky. We found that people do not remove configuration options because they don't know the impact of each of their uh, configuration options. Uh, the traceability between options and code is also challenging. It's not easy to find for a configuration option where uh, it is located or where it is uh, used in the source code. Uh, we also found other management related challenges such as in unclear configuration ownership. There's no clear rules who should add options, who should remove them, who should uh, change them. Uh, etc. In this paper, we are trying to address 13 challenges by proposing four principles that a configuration framework should uh, implement. Uh, we obtain those four principles by a prototyping uh, technique. Uh, we interview with experts. Um, after those interviews, we obtained ideas about what are the typical uh, principles that a configuration framework should uh, implement. Then we developed those ideas and we, uh, in the prototype, which we presented in the next interview and we got feedback from another expert and we got new ideas. And we kept improving our framework, uh, our four principles, uh, until getting at the end a framework called config to code that implements our four uh, principles. The first principle consists of uh, bringing configuration options, uh, mid data inside the source code. We found in our prior study that developers do not consider configuration as code. Therefore, the best practices that are related to, to the source code are not applied to configuration, such as uh, re code review. So we found that people do not review options because they consider options as an external artifact. Therefore, to mitigate this problem, we bring configuration metadata inside the code. For example, if you want to say that username is an option that can be changed by uh, a user, uh, we just add the annotation as config that defines all the metadata related to that option, such as the name, the, the, the comment that describes it, uh, the default value or constraint, and where is this option. Um, the second principle consists of automatically generating the configuration uh, file. We found that uh, projects can have uh, multiple uh, configuration mediums for the same project. And that makes the understanding of uh, configuration and the usage of software system uh, more uh, difficult. Um, we also have an inconsistency between configuration files and the source code. Therefore, to uh, avoid this problem, we propose a principle that automatically uses the annotations that are inside the code and generates the configuration file. The third principle is to access the uh, the 
the configuration file from one provider, one class. And this is the encapsulation problem. And traditionally, developers access options everywhere in the source code, while um, in this uh, principle, we suggest to, to access them from one uh, provider class. The last principle consists of validating the quality of an option, such as a validating naming convention. Here we say that the name of option is mandatory to respect certain format. And if it doesn't, we show an error uh, during the compilation. Uh, this is the error message. For example, here we have a very long name for option, therefore we show an error. You can show an seed uh, just a warning. And when this uh, error is fixed, uh, there is no error or warning. Uh, we validate our four principles via user study in which we compared config to code and preferences, the state of the practice uh, framework uh, on Jabref. So Jabref by default used preferences and we implemented a second version for Jabref that used config to code. 55, 55 participants were involved in our user study. We implemented 10 configuration engineering uh, tasks related to the creation, refactoring, etc. And uh, we validate our four principles via two research questions. Uh, do the principles increase the correctness? And do the principles reduce the time to uh, accomplish a task? And we found that our, our framework is able to improve seven tasks. It doesn't, uh, I mean, there's no case where preferences is better. And we were not able to improve three tasks. For the time we were able to improve five tasks, uh, we did not improve the three. And preferences were faster in one task. Finally, configuration is. Uh, caused a lot of problems and we found that the robbers faced 22 challenges in prior studies. In this paper we proposed 13, uh, we proposed four principles to uh, improve the configuration frameworks which we uh, validate via user study and we found that the four principles improve the state of the practice uh, framework uh, preferences. Thank you. Uh, we don't hear you. Can you turn on turn on your mic? Ah, oh, sorry, I muted. <laughs> um, uh, so we have a question, and the question is: Would you imagine configuring many frameworks and their dependence all within the same code? For instance, configure SQL, diverse libraries, and so on. Yeah. So the idea here is that we are proposing a framework that access uh, configuration mediums like files, databases, etc. Um, and yeah, so we, basically we can, yeah, we can transform a source code to use uh, config to code and access different configurations. Uh, for the evaluation, we evaluate just configuration files. Uh, but as I showed in the, in the, the slide, we can change the, the source of an option to a different uh, artifact. Like we can say this option should came from a file, this one should came from uh, arguments, this one should came from a database, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And actually we are right, right on time for the second presentation. And the second presentation is the, the Smart Shark ecosystem for software repository mining. And Stefan will present. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Um, so since I only have three minutes, I skip who we are so you can see it here. Um, instead um, go directly to our ecosystem. So basically um, in software repository mining, usually people combine a lot of different tools and then you have some JSON output here, JSON output there, and um, you somehow need to combine everything for your analysts. And our approach is a bit different. We basically are simulating a one ring approach. We want to have one system to analyze everything, to mine everything, to orchestrate and everything, and then combine everything in a single database. So basically that we get a single point of truth where we can run our analysts again. And um, we achieve this by having an orchestration front end which we call server shark that basically triggers data collections. Then with the server shark, we basically run command line tools because this is sometimes very workload intensive. We have batch systems in the background that executes this. Um, every all data is stored in the MongoDB that we can then access um, yeah, basically from any application that supports MongoDB. And additionally, we have our visual front end, um, which allows us mostly to do some, in, uh, get in some insights into, into the data, but also to perform manual validation of the results. 
and the data. So we can access all kinds of data sources, and this is yeah, constantly growing. So Git, Bugzilla, Jira, um, but also um, software metrics with um, static analyzer or uh, warnings with PMD. We manually validate whether uh, issues really have the type that is listed in the Jira system or that links from commits to um, issues are really as they are specified or if they're wrong. And well, then obviously you can use this data to do all sorts of analysis, for example, over time in a repository. Um, currently we're running a study using this, so we would be happy if you join us. And obviously we have our live demonstration at, at I think um, 5.10 in uh, UTC, so in one and a half hours, and we'd be happy if you join us. So thanks a lot for your presentation. And uh, I think it's time to, to go to the other presentation, just to keep the, the, the pace. But if there are people that want to make questions, please uh, may write your questions, and then uh, the, the author can ask where or can, can discuss with you. So the third presentation is called uh, Piranha, uh, Reducing Feature Flag Debt at Uber. And Murali will present live and will be here for answering questions. And please write your question as soon as you have, because at the end I will also summarize and make questions. Yes. Okay, thanks Patricia. Uh, today I'll present our work on Piranha, a tool for uh, automatically deleting code related to stale feature flags. This has been used to reduce uh, feature flag debt at Uber. Um, so let me give you some background of, uh, on feature flags. Uh, various features are implemented uh, as part of the same source, and uh, these features are guarded by uh, feature flags. So for a mobile app, when a binary is shipped to the app store, the same binary is uh, downloaded and installed by various uh, mobile users. When an app instance is opened, uh, uh, the data pertaining to which features are enabled is sent uh, to that specific app instance, thereby enabling a subset of uh, features. In this manner, different app instances will have uh, different features enabled. There are uh, many benefits of using uh, feature flags. One is the customized user experience. Second, uh, it helps in gradual rollout of uh, features, wherein uh, we can use data uh, from the initial stages to refine uh, the feature and uh, quick uh, rollback in the presence of uh, failures. And uh, it also is used for uh, A-B testing between uh, various features. At the time of uh, writing this paper, we had around uh, more than 6,000 flags across uh, multiple apps at Uber. To use a, a feature flag in uh, the source, a developer needs to first uh, define the flag and uh, use the flag as part of uh, various feature flag APIs. In this example, the feature flag API is, is treated. And then uh, test uh, the feature under various configurations, when it is in, under treatment, when it is under control, and so on. So given this is a, how feature flags are used, what are stale feature flags? We define a stale feature flag as follows. When the purpose that necessitated its introduction is uh, resolved, then we consider that flag to be stale. For example, a flag that is used to control geographical locations is rolled out globally. Then that flag is uh, obsolete for all practical purposes. In other words, uh, code in one of the branches can execute unconditionally in the presence of stale flags. So a good software engineering practice demands that uh, we need to delete code from the stale branch and delete any other code artifact that is reachable only from this branch, and then delete unit test pertaining to the stale flag. Not deleting the code due to stale feature flags introduces technical debt. So consider this abstraction of a program where branching is due to feature flags. And uh, let's say uh, there is a stale feature flag here. And now that branch is never executed, and uh, if that code persists, we have, uh, uh, there are multiple drawbacks, right? There is unnecessary code paths. The second is the binary includes uh, dead code. Third, uh, it uh, increases the overall compilation and uh, testing times, uh, because testing of sale feature flags need to be done because it's part of the code. Uh, it increases the payload size that uh, the server needs to send to the various app instances. It, this can be a problem where network bandwidth is critical, 
and overall uh, the coding complexity associated with uh, uh, developing features and adding feature flags becomes much more harder for a developer now deleting this code and all the corresponding uh, regions that are reachable will address all these uh, remove all these uh, drawbacks but uh, the elephant in the room that nobody talks about is the manual effort required to address this technical debt so at uber we have uh, implemented uh, pirana uh, pirana is automated uh, refactoring tool it is uh, customizable for uh, various feature flag uh, apis uh, it accepts as input the source code the stale flag that needs to be removed and the treatment behavior that needs to be preserved and uh, it generates a modified source code under the hood it analyzes uh, abstract syntax trees uh, rewrites the code based on uh, the input uh, flag and treatment behavior and uh, deletes any other additional code that becomes unreachable due to the prior uh, deletion so this is a snapshot of a diff that was generated using pirana as you may notice uh, there are uh, number of lines deleted across the file that this diff landed as is uh, into the master in order to help uh, developers manage uh, stale flags effectively uh, we also built an automated uh, developer workflow uh, wherein there is a flag tracker that periodically uh, queries for uh, various uh, uh, stale flags and then uh, provides them as input to pirana pirana accepts that and uh, the source as input and uh, generates uh, stale flag uh, cleanup diffs and assigns them to the owner of uh, the flag. Now the owner can uh, land a diff after uh, reviewing it and make additional changes if necessary. And if the flag is not stale, they can inform the flag tracker that uh, this flag can be snoozed and uh, can be cleaned up at a later date. So we deployed Pirana and uh, uh, obtained results for, for this uh, time period listed here. So Pirana was implemented for uh, Java, Objective-C, and Swift code in mobile apps at Uber. And uh, it helped uh, delete more than uh, 1381 uh, stale flags, approximately 17% of total flags at the time of writing this paper. At this point, it has deleted more than 2,500 flags. It has also helped delete uh, more than 100,000 lines of code as part of this process. So this graph shows the activity on the generated diffs. Uh, the x-axis shows uh, the of diffs that are landed, abandoned, and where there are no activity. And the percentage, the y-axis shows the number of flags that have uh, been processed. So if you notice, there are uh, close to 88% of uh, uh, the generated uh, diffs have been acted upon, either landed or abandoned, with the majority of them being landed, of course. Uh, and then we also looked at other metrics. Um, we observed that 65% uh, of diffs landed without uh, any additional uh, changes by the user. 85% of the diffs actually compile and pass tests. 80% of diffs affect more than one file, showing uh, the complexity of the potential changes pertaining to flags. And 75% uh, of the diffs were processed within a week, showing the urgency with which developers uh, wanted to clean up uh, these stale flags. And more than 200 developers have interacted with at least one diff, showing the widespread nature of uh, usage of some tool like Pirana. Uh, Pirana is open sourced. It is available from this uh, link, and uh, uh, contributions are welcome to this. Uh, there are a number of uh, open problems. I'll quickly list them before summarizing. So there are uh, open problems pertaining to extending Pirana for uh, other languages, uh, integration of Pirana with other developer workflows, including Git, Fabricator, and so on, integrating it with uh, various flag management systems, and in general, there are a number of uh, flag-related uh, developer pain points that we have observed uh, during our work at Uber. Uh, one is how to efficiently uh, uh, track the flags in the source code, uh, consider doing flag dependency analysis, how to automatically test flag configurations, and then availability of runtime flag information in the IDE to help developers understand, get a perspective of uh, uh, the usage of flags. Uh, here is the summary slide. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So thanks a lot for your presentation. And indeed, we have some questions. Um, the first question is, have you experienced runtime faults as the results of stale flags? Uh, runtime 
faults as a result of uh, stale flags i cannot comment on that whether there were uh, runtime uh, faults because of uh, stale flag cleanup no there are there have been no runtime faults because of uh, stale flag cleanup okay then the follow up question is in practice have bugs been caused by removing them uh, so the, the, the bugs don't happen because what happens is in this process when we uh, generate a diff ultimately the developer has to decide whether to land the uh, cleanup diff or not so if the diff the generated diff is buggy then uh, the developer will make further changes on top of uh, the cleanup diff and then land it our uh, data shows 65% of the diffs were landed as is uh, only 35% of the diffs had uh, required further uh, changes where more uh, cleanup had to happen Okay, let's move to another question. Uh, the other question is, how precise is the dead code analysis, implicit flow, field sensitivity, etc.? Right, so uh, we had, we discussed this in the paper. So there are uh, two, uh, two trade-offs, right? One is to build a, a sound and complete, uh, uh, try to build a sound and complete reachability analysis, try to remove dead code uh, as precisely as possible, or uh, try to implement something that works in practice that is applicable for uh, practical code bases. We chose the later due to resource constraints and uh, we tried to uh, uh, build Piranha uh, catering to the kind of coding patterns that we observed. And uh, so that is the level of uh, precision that we have currently with Piranha. So thanks a lot also for your question, for your answers and we can move towards the, the other presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thanks again. So the fourth paper actually uh, is the, yes, is a paper titled Towards Engineering Future Gainful Applications. And this is a new ideas paper. And the presenter is Antonio Bucchiarone from FPK. Antonio, yeah, you are muted, sorry. Sorry, I'm here, so let's share the screen. So you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay, good. I'm presenting a work with, uh, with Anna Paola Marconi from FBK and Antonio Cicchetti from Maladen University in Sweden about uh, how to gamify in general uh, software application and tools. And this is, uh, um, a, a visionary paper that you wrote this year. So what is gamification? Gamification is when we use uh, uh, game elements in uh, a non-game context, so in serious uh, uh, context in general. And um, we need gamification when uh, we want to engage people to change their uh, habits, usually when we want to have an impact in some uh, societal challenge. And uh, in order to do this, we want to adopt uh, game-like uh, solutions you know, to support uh, these engagements that can be done in different contexts. For example, in education, in mobility, when we want to change uh, to uh, versus the mobility, the sustainable mobility or in health. So gamification solutions usually are a separate mechanisms that must be designed and developed as a side application. Uh, so what is our vision? Our vision is that we want to have a line of research in software engineering where we want to inject the gameful mechanism in order to make software applications gamified. So what does it mean this? This means that first of all, uh, we want to have an approach for software engineering for, for uh, the developing of gameful applications. Uh, and uh, if we take the, the, the software application to make this gameful, we need to have the game part. Like that is a uh, uh, main ingredient of the development. Um, and of course, we need to have a gamification engine that is devoted to this part of the software application. The second aspect that we need to have a gameful mechanism that uh, are devoted to, to uh, manage specific concerns of the software application related to the, to the game part. And uh, finally, we need to have gaming aspects that are a separate plugin uh, that uh, will be uh, in increase the, the gamification aspect of. Uh, of the application of the software in general. So for this, we are defining an architecture. So how we can transform 
a software application developed by third parties in a, in a gameful system. So this means that uh, from a third party software application, we need to have a wrapping components able to understand what are the actions in the software application that must be gamified. And uh, the gamification framework uh, consider all the aspects uh, to develop uh, a gameful application from the design to, to the runtime. An important aspect here is that the execution time, we should monitor the status of the game in some way, and we should be able to adapt the game if we see some strange behavior in the players. And of course, we need to have some logging facilities and analytics that report to the player that in this case are the developers of, of this specific software application to show them the player status and the advancement in the game. Of course, we need to have also the evolution part so we can simulate and learn the game running and we can evolve the design parts of this game full application. So the second aspect is uh, what's happened when we have uh, multiple games with multiple purposes and we want to generate uh, a game of games, you know? So we have defined this uh, a novel architecture where we can start from gamification fragments and so the pieces of code that are devoted to specific game concepts and we have a multi-game campaign like a goal and you know, we want to reach a sustainability in a specific uh, societal challenge but when we have multiple for example in mobility or in health uh, or education we want to or orchestrate them in a unique application and in order to do this the orchestrator we generated the execution behavior of the application that includes all the aspects derived from the different game aspects in a unique execution process that will be the uh, application execution logic. So with these three two architectures, of course, we have some implication in the software engineering field. First of all, we need to introduce a set of domain specific languages to integrate this gamification aspect in, in general software application. The second aspect is the, we need to have mechanism to personalize and adapt the, the, the game at runtime because for specific players, we, need, we, we would like to have specific game mechanism and specific adaptation cases for, for the specific player. The third aspect is we want to have game of games and for this, we need to have a way to represent the fragments derived from the different game aspects. At the same time, we need to have formal methods to guarantee that one game impact will not affect the other game impact. And for this, we want to have some contradiction analysis in, in, in the framework. So this is our idea. So if you have questions and remarks, I'm here for answering your, your questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Antonio, for your presentation. And we have a question. Uh, game rules can be uh, trans transversal in the existing features. When this happens, gamification becomes more challenging. How do you evaluate these scenarios? Yes, this is related to, to this picture in the sense that gamification fragments for us are rules from different aspects. So the different colors are the different societal uh, uh, goal. You know? For example, you want to have a goal in the mobility at the same time in the health you can have contradiction on this. And uh, the orchestrator is in charge to guarantee the satisfiability of the multi-game campaign that put together different aspects and different rules from different games. And uh, this execution plan, if exists, of course, it will satisfy the multi-game campaign. Th this is probably the architecture that uh, we want to realize in the future to, to do this uh, multi-future combination. Yeah, and if you answer very fast, we have also another question okay. that I had, I had one very similar. It's about the, um, if you can tell a bit more about what kind of applications can be gamified. Yeah, yeah. we, we have a, an example that we have submitted the models this year. Uh, we have gamified the new ML plugin for uh, UML models, for example, the Papyrus plugin. Uh, so in order to make uh, gamified the, the educational part of UML modeling for students. So every action in the UML diagram modeling will be points uh, in some games that the teacher uh, can, can uh, define for, for the classroom, for example. Well, we have also other ideas and we can discuss offline, of course, on the experience that I did on this. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, now we need to change on the on the last presentation that is uh, titled Software Development Data for Architecture Analysis, Expectation, Reality, and Future Direction. And this is an uh, uh, industrial practice paper. Okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. So um, this is a joint work with Dr. Rick Katzman. My name is Yuan Fang from Drexel University. And so first of all, what do we mean by, you know, software architecture is healthy or decaying? You know, the rationale is that, you know, if the software architecture is healthy, it should support fast feature delivery because it's designed that way to support new features. And if there's a bug, you know, found in the system, the bug should be to be fixed, you know, locally and without severe ripple effects. And the developers should be able to just implement their own parts independently and in parallel. So first of all, how do we tell if it is the case? We have to continuously collecting data from the development process. If we do observe that the feature delivery velocity is slowing down or bug rate is increasing, um, then we have to diagnose this, right? Whether it is caused by the decaying design. If yes, then where the de decay is and shall we refactor? So all these uh, decisions should be made based on, you know, data. So in um, our um, solution, and we propose like four parts to address this problem, architecture uh, analysis and monitoring. Um, so first of all, we measure, we continuously measure and monitor um, the program entities and their dependency relations using a new uh, maintainability matrix. And the second, we design and uh, we define and detect a number of design anti patterns. These anti patterns are defined using both evolution history, like a code change information, and the dependence relation. Uh, third, we also continuously uh, tracking the active hotspots during software evolution. So, in order to track hotspots, we have to collect data from issue report, evolution history, and the dependence relation. And using all these data, you know, given any design that, you know, the user identified, we can calculate the cost and benefit and the return on investment to help the management to determine whether it is worthwhile to refactor or not. So um, over the past few years, we have published the five case study with different industrial collaborators of different domain and sizes, et cetera. The basic process is that we collect the data from uh, their development process, including code dependency, revision history, issue record, et cetera. And we automatically conduct, you know, um, you know anti-pattern detection and maintainability measure and ROI, you know, um, calculation and send a report back to the developers and architects for their feedback. And um, so for the, um, you know, data needed, you know, uh, by our tool suite, um, we call that deviate, including the dependence relation among entities, which can be extracted using any dependency tool. So we really don't care like what programming language you are using, as long as you can uh, extract dependency using some kind of tools, um, then a DVA will accept it. So normally we use depends or understand. And another type of data is the code change data, which can be extracted from review history, including Git, SVN, et cetera. And issue information can be extracted from Jira and Microsoft Team Foundation, but Villa, you know, um, these uh, well-known issue tracking systems. So given all this data, our first job is to uh, measure and monitor maintainability, maintainability using a new um, in ten of it is um, metrics, which we call the coupling level, which we proposed um, in XC 2016. So the basic idea of this the new metric is that, you know, we value independent true modules. You know, a module is a true module if it can be changed and revised without influencing other parts of the system. And the more independent it is, the, more, the smaller it is, the more valuable it is. And from the system perspective, the more independent modules we have, the more valuable the system is and the higher the decoupling level. And so this is the industrial project. We monitored and measured its decoupling score 
over its 29 releases over nine uh, over six years. And over this period, we observed like four non-trivial changes of the decoupling score. And we talked to their architects and they confirmed that each of the non-trivial variation faithfully indicated the major architecture variation. So for example, the first stage, uh, the DL increase from 45 to 74 is when they transform this software project from a prototype to a real product. Then as time goes by, you know, um, um, the developers keep adding features and technical debt accumulating and the decoupling level drops a little bit. The surprise comes in the third stage and when the architect told us that at this time period, he actually refactored the system, expecting that the decoupling level goes up rather than going down, right? So we look at his implementation, we realized that the refactoring was not very successful, introduced some wrong cyclical dependency and really decreased the architecture uh, modularity. So the team worked with this technical data for another period of time. In the end, they couldn't bear with it and they spent about two months to clear up the technical debt and we see the decoupling level increase again. So uh, we have collected data from about 700 um, open source projects and we hope to form a modularity health chart so that each project can you know, check how healthy the system is against other industrial projects. For example, this project's decoupling level is 54%, ranked only like 6% of similar projects. So um, the user should be able to compare with uh, projects using the same language and same domain, um, similar size, et cetera. Second, you know, um, it's about the six anti-patterns we defined. So the, of all the six anti-patterns, the last three, you know, like package cycle is very well known. Um, it's the um, cyclic dependency among namespaces and the uh, file clicks that the uh, uh, strongly connect components, you know, linking multiple files and improper inheritance that's checking the violation of links of execution principles. And these three are used structural information only. So here I want to emphasize the first three, which we define using both structural information and code change information. So we have an, um, detect these anti patterns from many, many industrial and open source projects. And it has um, shown that uh, you know, these anti patterns to be highly correlated with box churns and churn. So this is the first one on stable interface. As we can see, um, number two, file number two is highly influential. It influences many files um, within this group. This DP is just a, a general way to express dependency. And uh, um, if you see the number here, which these are the numbers, they were co-changed based on their revealing history in the given time period. As you can see, this file is very influential, is very unstable. So we call this phenomenon uh, unstable interface. Uh, we actually have a web version of this tool. Here you can see that uh, uh, this file here, abstract Java node, it has many dependencies and it, you know, um, is dependent by many files in different ways, right? If you click code change, you will see that they all change together very frequently. And the second type of uh, uh, second type of uh, uh, anti pattern is crossing. It's when we detect a file that it has both high signing and high sign out. So if we're representing a matrix format, is in the center of the crossing shape. And uh, uh, in the meantime, it also um, changed frequently with uh, many other files. So our experience shows that this type of uh, structure, the crossing, is really the true design that is. You, know, you have a file that is, you know, changed together with many other files at the center of um, the finding and find out. So this is the um, um, this is the example, you know, um, of crossing. As you can see, the green dot info.java has many signing and sign out. And if we do not uh, choose code change, as you can see that, um, you know, very clear arrow signing and sign out. And um, uh, if you click code change, you know, it changed together with almost everybody else in this group. Um, so these, these two are normally, you know, we have very relative amount of times uh, they indicate true technical depth. 
Uh, finally, the modularity violation. This is also from an industrial project. These files look very uncoupled. They are not related to each other at all. But if you look at revision history, they change together almost all the time. So the, when we talked to the architect, they told us that uh, they share some kind of message parsing logic, you know, copy paste code clone. And when uh, one piece of the code changes, then many other pieces of code have to be changed together. So, you know, um, yeah, modularity violation. Let's see, I can find the one. Yeah, as you can see here, if we do not select code change and this file has no relation with the rest of the file, right? It seems that it is decoupled from the rest. But, you know, if you look at review history, uh, they are actually tightly coupled. So these are the three you know, anti-patterns we define using both history and the structural information. And another type of um, um, you know, um, depth detection is active hotspot tracking. And we have shown that you know, the more error prone the files are, the more likely they are connected. And um, uh, the majority of the error prone change from files can be captured by just very few, very few hotspots. The one we are looking at is the hotspot we detected from Camel. And the first time period, you know, we see a hotspot of six files grow into 13, remain to be big, and you know, scale down. If we extend this, you know, timeline, we will see the hotspot will grow again in the future. So basically, you know, we advise you know the development team to just track you know the hotspot um, of a period of interest, right? And then detect any patterns within these hotspots. So this is one example we detected from another industrial project. This 31 files, you know, is a hotspot and is detected as hotspot using our tool. And in the meantime, it has unstable interface, file click, and many anti-patterns. And if you look at it, the change rate, um, you know, it's highly frequent. For example, this file 26, it was changed like 361 times during the given time period, ranked the number 0.1 percentile, like extremely error prone files and uh, all these other files ranking are also very high, which means this is a true hotspot. Okay, using all these data and we can calculate the maintenance cost of each anti-pattern, each flaw, each pattern instances and each hotspot. And we can calculate the return on investment too. So in this uh, industrial project, we found, you know, click, you know, there are 26 instance of click involves 322 files, takes 21%, but covers about 45% you know, of all the bug changes. And this is the data for each single click, so the user can determine which one is most severe and should be refactored first. And this is the case we did in 2015, where we um, detected three technical debt, analyzed um, you know, the current penalty caused by these debt, and also expected benefits by fixing these debt. And the uh, development team were able to estimate you know, the refactoring cost in terms of many months, person months, because we already make it very concrete, right? These files need to be refactored. You know, the problem is caused by, for example, Coca-Cola. And they were able to determine that, you know, uh, after if they refactor this part, they can have achieved like 300 return on investment for the first year. Okay, so um, yeah, these are the two, these are the techniques uh, we, we propose and the four techniques all together. And over the past, I'm just into briefly introduce the most recent case study, you know, with two companies. And this is the one with ABB and we analyzed the um, eight different projects within ABB and we ranked their decoupling level. And this project is ranked the lowest, you know, 28%. And the development team admit that it has severe maintenance problem and needs to be refactored. And uh, um, uh, and this one um, is uh, is a, a startup company. And uh, the, what happened is that you know one day they came to us and saying that we feel like we have some technique for that, but we don't know where it is and how severe they are. So we run a report and got back to them and we didn't hear from them for a whole year. And a year later, they came back to us and they were saying that we refactored our system based on a report and want to run, run it again to see if the uh, architecture that has been removed, you know, whether the refactoring to prove the refactoring was successful. So as you can see, like after um, refactoring, they removed the majority of the um, anti-patterns, for example, the crossing reduced from 29 to six and the uh, file influence also reduced drastically. 
Um, but that's not all. You know, we also calculated that after refactoring, um, the average time needed to, to fix bugs reduced by 30%, and average length of code needed to, to fix bugs reduced by 67%. And uh, similarly, the time spent on closing general change requests reduced significantly, you know, after refactoring. So this way we can just prove for, to their management that the refactoring is a successful one, it's worthwhile. And so um, these analysis we proposed, how spot and anti-pattern and uh, the coupling level and the uh, return investment analysis can be accurately conducted in successful open source projects. Successful, because the observation is that this project is success are successful first because they are managed very rigorously. And some industrial projects cannot benefit from all the analysis techniques. For example, some of them cannot just uh, detect all the anti-patterns because they are not managed uh, very well. So uh, we expect, you know, in order to conduct actor analysis rigorously, and the project has to be managed rigorously, right? So the source code has been managed by Gato SVN, that's basic. And most importantly, each task, a new feature, bug improvement, refactoring should be labeled and categorized. Not every industrial you know, uh, company do that. And each commit should be linked to a task, right? Um, and you complete a task with a task assist. But in reality, you know, this is happening in the successful open source projects we, we analyzed so far. But in reality, you know, tasks are often not properly labeled or categorized. And uh, um, some developers, you know, some companies do require tasks to be characterized and they require the commits to be linked to a task issue, but developers find various ways to get around it. For example, they could, they could create a general task issue and all the commits, they don't want to spend the time to think, you know, what is this board linked to the general issue? And, you know, most of the commits are not really linked to task properly or, you know, the, the commits, you know, uh, with one single lens of change, rather than just commit, you know, um, link the commit to a, you know, cohesive task. I don't think it's their, their problem, right? The developers do not see the value of rigorously follow the rigorous process until they see, you know, the data can be used that, um, in, in valuable way. So what happened many times is that, you know, we, we show them deviate and the result from open source project. We tell them which analysis we can do for their project, which cannot do. Then they start to, evaluate, to realize the importance of following uh, the rigorous process. And in academia research, we often assume, you know, ideal data quality, but, you know, uh, it's not the case at all. The industrial um, the industry really do not want to change their way of doing things until they see greater value. Okay, so um, there are some general suggestions, you know, uh, in order for uh, to bridge the gap between academia research and industry, we need to demonstrate the value to the practitioners to motivate rigorous development process. And we also need to really set up a, a software health chart because the we have been studying software metrics for many, many decades, right? But people are st still asking the question, is this project good enough? You know, how do I compare multiple projects within my company, right? So if we can have an industrial benchmark, a health chart, and people can um, compare their project with industrial project and within with project within their own company. Third one, well, most important thing. Yeah. It's time to conclude. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's the yeah. Last, uh, last bullet. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we need to link the time and efforts and to the maintainability score. That's it. And finally, more education training is essential. Questions? Thanks a lot for your talk. Okay, and thank you. Yes, we have some questions. And I don't know if we will have time to, uh, to talk about all of them, but I suggest you to copy it because this can be useful for you. So the okay. first one is, is Dev8 Suite open source? Uh, it has a free academia version. Uh, it's not completely open source, but it has a free academia version. Um, yeah, you can con it's continually being developed. So we didn't formally release it, right? But anyone want to try it, we can send you a copy, you know, for free, for sure. Yeah, yeah. but maybe somebody can ask you, you can write an email and you can give the access, right? Okay, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, good. 
so another question is to to what extent do practitioners agree with the design that that your tool identifies and also to what extent uh, they are willing or eager to fix oh okay so this is a complicated question basically yeah. um you know for um unhealthy inheritance and the crossing um, we haven't we haven't encountered a situation that the developers disagree. You know, they say this is not a problem. Um, you know, so far, you know, I, I cannot recall any. But I think you know whether it's refactor, there are a lot of debates. You know, um, so they have to consider refactoring from you know business perspective, right? Um, but we feel like once they can see the 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 um, the cost that incurred by the debt, they are more willing to to refactor. Basically, you know, um, of the ABB case I just showed, um, it's in our XD uh, paper, and this project refactored. You know, this uh, Bradsquid project refactored, obviously. And uh, for the ABB case, for the eight projects, and uh, uh, six of them, you know, have low decoupling level. Uh, are all being refactored, you know, by the or they want to refactor by the time we present them this result. Yeah, basically, yeah. people want to see data, you know, before they make this big decision to refactor. Yeah, sure. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Young Fang. Oh, can you hear me? I'm still uh, here. No, yes, no, yes, yeah. <laughs> Okay. There was a small silence. <laughs> yeah, oh, I feel like I keep myself, talking. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I think Patrizio is offline. We lost our session chair, do we? Okay, I, I think we can close the <laughs> session. Uh, <laughs> we don't have more questions. So thank you all of you for, for attending. Thank you for all the presenters. And we hope to see you in next sessions. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
right. Welcome to the session, the virtual X session on dependencies and uh, configuration. I'm Diomedes Spinellis from Professor of Software Engineering at the Athens University of Economics and Business. I have three papers in this uh, session, two technical papers, a technical papers track session, and one from the software engineering and practice session. The first paper is uh, titled Lazy Product Discovery in Huge Configuration Spaces by Michael Linhardt, Ferruccio Damiani, Anna Brock Johnson, and Jacopo Mauro. We cannot hear you, so... Uh, Sorry. Yes. Okay. okay. You can start so, from the beginning. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sorry. So I, I was saying that my talk is about, like I said, the lazy product discovery in huge configured spaces. And this title is actually in three parts. So, first, huge configured spaces, product discovery, and laziness. The first, huge configured spaces broadly means having a lot of options to configure that are somewhat constrained. And a good example of that is again two Linux distribution, because that distribution is source based and all of its packages are configurable. That means that the collection of its almost 37,000 packages uh, contains in total almost 700,000 options to configure. And uh, also the specificity of Gen2 is, like I said before, the fact that these, these options are constrained. So that, for instance, if you select the static lib option in the libgudev package, you need to select it also in the udev package. So they're all connected. On the other hand, product discovery corresponds to the automatic configuration of a system. And in the context of a Linux distribution, it is the task of its packet manager. <clears throat> that is computing from a user request uh, this set of package to install, to uninstall, and how to configure them. So that pro problem is product, uh, of product discovery is NP complete in general. So it is not very tractable in very large source spaces like huge configured spaces such as Gentoo. Of course, Gentoo has its own packet manager that performs product discovery in practice, but it is based on ad hoc and incomplete heuristics that fails in our tests more than 26% of the time. Finally, uh, laziness is a main contribution of the paper. It is the approach we take to make product discovery tractable in practice without losing soundness nor completeness. It is, uh, the idea is very simple. We start with a small search space and we uh, extend it uh, incrementally by need. So this is actual uh, algorithm of the approach. I won't go into detail over it. I just want to point out two key features of this algorithm, which is uh, first, the pick cut function, which is the way we use to reduce the search space. And the loop here actually expands the search space incrementally, like I said, by need when we don't find a solution uh, in the smaller search space. So it is important to note that this algorithm is actually generic because we don't actually fix the pick cut function here. And this is shown in this theorem here. It says that the, this algorithm is sound and complete for any correct pick cut function. And we will see in the next slides what correct can mean. So to identify correct picket function, we uh, look at the <coughs> theoretical aspects of configuration spaces. And formally, a configuration space can be modeled with a feature model. So features in this model are options and products are correct configurations. And additionally, in the literature, we can find we can, it's documented a slice operator that projects a feature model onto a subset of features. So for instance, you can consider that y here is a search space and it projects a smaller search space and you project a configuration space, configuration space onto that uh, search space. So it reduces the search space, so it looks like a possible picket function, but actually it is not because it forgets about dependencies. So if you look for, if you want to, for instance, to install libgudev, in the algorithm like three, the search space will start to be libgudev itself, which makes sense. But then in like four, the slice function fails to extend the search space to include libgudev dependencies such as udev. And so the resulting, the result that this algorithm will give you is actually only installing libgudev, which is not good because it forgets all about dependencies. So this algorithm actually characterizes uh, via the pickcat function. This first line here said that the um, pickcat function should, should return a configuration space that include all the 
consider option in the search phase. The uh, second line here said that the result uh, of the uh, the picket function should also include all the product. No, so, sorry, all the product of the result should also be product of the original configuration space. So we don't lose dependencies. This is basically what it means. And this characterization allows us to um, uh, identify. Uh, different big cut function. So the first one here is uh, computes the smallest uh, configuration space uh, co uh, for a given search space uh, here Y. I won't go in detail into how it works, a fixed point. And uh, this second here said that um, it's very simple actually to, to compute because it's just uh, an evaluation uh, test to, to, to make here, but it, it only works for configuration space that corresponds to uh, a logical uh, implication. The thing is, uh, in GAN2 uh, packages, the specification of GAN2 packages are um, implications, so we can use that in practice actually. So to evaluate our approach, we identify four research questions. The first one is, um, how much search space do we uh, do, do is reduced if we consider if we do use our lazy approach compared to the standard approach? And in practice, the second the second question asks in practice how much space and how much speed and memory do we gain using the uh, lazy approach instead of the normal approach? And the two later questions ask about the state of the art tool. How much do they fail? And how do the computation time and memory compare to our lazy approach? We answer these questions, so like I hinted previously on the gain tool Linux exploration by implementing the lazy and sub approaches. Here's a, the lazy approach is called PDPA and we implemented, like I said before, is a simple picket function. And we uh, executed 1000 random tests on uh, that, so asking, uh, between one and ten uh, package to to install and see what uh, what will be the result. Uh, so <clears throat> this first figure here shows that how much the search space are the approach loads compared to the standard approach, and in in average we see that it loads about one point five percent of the whole search space, which is quite small. So it's a good uh, good thing. In uh, practice, however, or in practice, we can see that it's, it's, it goes forward. We see here that it's about speed. Our, uh, our tool, our lazy approach, uses about uh, is, uh, is about sorry twelve times quicker than the uh, normal approach. And in about memory, uh, our lazy approach is about ten times uh, uses about ten times less memory than the standard approach, which takes about four gigabytes of memory. Uh, so this the, this figure here shows the failure rate of our tests. Seven out of tests in purple here actually didn't have any solution, and and uh, and emerge the success of these art tools failed for all the tests in blue. There are two hundred and sixty of them, so uh, the failure rate of emerge uh, actually is a little, slightly more than twenty six percent. Finally, we can see here that the lazy approach in green is still 111 times slower than image in blue and it takes about uh, five more times memory than image in blue. So uh, the, the, art of, the state of the art tool still outperform our lazy approach by quite a big factor here. So these results are summed up in this table. We can see that the standard approach is slightly more too expensive because it takes 16 minutes to, to compute takes four gigabytes of memory uh, compared to the, the tool which takes seven seconds and less than 100 uh, megabytes of memory. Uh, our lazy approach takes about uh, one to 20 seconds and one minute and 20 seconds. And well, it's, you can see it's a, you can imagine that it's a reasonable trade-off to achieve uh, completeness compared to the state of the art tool which that, that fails slightly. Uh, quite often. <clears throat> so for future work, we will, investigate, we will investigate other ways to improve our lazy approach. For, for instance, using some pre-computed data maybe or some other ad hoc SMT search strategies. We will also improve user integration possibly by using uh, our lazy approach as a fallback to the set of their tool so they will have the uh, nice uh, uh, time and memory usage when for simple pro problems but when it fails, we, we, can, we can still get completeness. And finally, we will also investigate the possibility of using our, our lazy approach in the HPC context to construct two chains for our configurable HPC solvers. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation.
Yeah, I remind our participants that you can ask uh, questions through Claudia. I don't see any questions yet, but I have a question. Can you please elaborate a bit more on the tests you used for evaluating the tools and how they handle the configurations? So basically, in uh, our tests generated uh, randomly uh, between one and 10 uh, package requests to install a package. And then we uh, send this request to, uh, um, to our lazy tool which uh, try to find a configuration for, for, for it. And so in, uh, when our conf since our tool is, is uh, well, supposed to be um, uh, complete uh, and we checked with our with, with the, we also the standard approach, uh, we can say that when it fails, there's no solution and actually also emerge the set of the art tool for, for going to fail in all the tests where our lazy approach failed. Uh, and then, so we, we, we generate 100 tests, 1,000 tests, and so we send them actually five times to all of our tools to have a codec in leverage time for all of these tests. So in the figure I, I showed here, we, we sorted all these tests in, in order of, uh, of loaded uh, search space to kind of have an idea of maybe uh, if there's a correlation between, for instance, for, between the, load, uh, the loaded space and uh, for, for instance, the, the completion time. Here we can see that there is, there is some kind of correlation, but it's not so, so clear because even if we uh, uh, try to, um, to reduce the test on the same, uh, to reduce the completion on the same test, still is, is, is the curve is not that uh, uh, smooth. But uh, this is still something that we can, that could be interesting to, to see. So. Mm -hmm. And one question from the audience, we have uh, about one minute to answer it. Have you looked at the similarities between product discovery between two different configurable systems? Will that come to this lead to transfer learning? Uh, between two... Uh... I'm not entirely sure I understand the, the question. I'm sorry, between two product discovery. So product discovery, in my understanding, is, is, a, is, a, is a tool to... Uh, to perform, uh, to, ex to, to compute a configuration. I understand uh, it would be, be two systems that have been configured in a different way from the solid same base. Uh, so if I understand correctly, so our tool doesn't, is, if, if the question is, if the our tool re returns the same result as, uh, as image when uh, the, the two tools uh, answer, uh, have, a, have a correct answer? So maybe maybe it is that. So uh, our tool does not answer the same thing, or is the result are, are different because uh, of the way it processes. For instance, uh, image does a, um, a search in the in the dependency tree, and it's very efficient. And um, using the, the different ad hoc uh, heuristics, it computes more or less a very uh, let's say clean solution. While uh, our uh, lazy tool is based on a generic SMT solver, or SAT solver, so it returns the first solution it found. So it's a little bit less, uh, the result is slightly less uh, nice, let's say. So we need to uh, to clean up a little bit after uh, the zone three it returns. Okay, and the, which solver is that? Because we have another question if uh, whether you use the mechanized, uh, whether the formalization was mechanized into a proof of systems such as Cork is very or PBS? Uh, no, it is not. We, uh, mm -hmm. we, do, the, we do the proof by hand. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's let's, thank, you, thank you very much uh, again. We're moving Welcome. to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, titled Reducing Runtime Adaptation Space by Analysis of Possible Utility Bounds by Clay Stevens and uh, Hamid Pagheri. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can uh, see this slide. Um, my name is Clay Stevens and I'm a grad student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln advised by Dr. Hamid Bagheri. And I'm going to tell you about our research in reducing the runtime adaptation space for self-adaptive systems. Um, in this case, we're talking about systems that can change their configuration dynamically at runtime in response to changes in the environment. In many domains, this is completely invaluable. There's no other way to do it, but it does come at a steep computational cost because at runtime, you would have to compare the other configurations that you might trans 
that you might adapt and change into. Um, and those configurations can grow exponentially in the number of attributes that you're having to compare. Um, this can be especially hard for things like uh, embedded systems or other sort of low power or low computing devices like drones. Um, that said, a classic example of a self-adaptive system would be a uh, self-balancing web infrastructure or cloud server system that can add or remove servers in response to demand for the content that they're providing. Um, in particular, you might consider a system that can reduce the number of servers or add a new server as needed in order to increase the risk to, to improve the response time. Uh, that comes at the cost of an additional monetary cost for each server that you're running. Um, you may also consider a situation where the, the percentage of content has changed, where the system can either reduce or increase the amount of content they're transferring, say by reducing the video quality in a streaming video. Um, now, many of these are instantaneous, but some of them, like adding a new server, takes a little bit of time because you have to wait for the server to spin up. So you're not necessarily going to get the benefit of the reduced uh, response time until some time has passed. Uh, and that adds some additional complications. So sort of naive um, baseline brute force approach is to react to changes in the environment by considering all of the configurations as soon as the environment has changed and picking the best one. That doesn't always work because in some cases, like I said, the benefits that you would accrue don't happen immediately. There is some latency in the effect of an adaptation. So reactive approach isn't great for that. You're also considering uh, potentially configurations that you can't reach within a single uh, run, single decision cycle. So you may need to, to try to add four servers or something which you, you can't do in one step. Um, so the state of the art approach is to take a, um, a proactive adaptation and to be aware of these latencies. So in this case, you're only looking at the configurations that are currently reachable from your state and uh, within your time horizon. And you're also taking into account the accrual of the utility that might happen later. Uh, even so, that's still considering all of the reachable configurations. So our insight is that there may be ways to remove some, some more of these configurations because some of them may never be chosen anyway. Some of them may always be suboptimal. So what we want to do is eliminate all of these suboptimal adaptations offline before the system even begins to run so that we can reduce the runtime computational load on the system. Uh, just a quick example to sort of drive that home. Imagine we're at a current configuration and can adapt to either configuration A or configuration B. If we imagine the utility that we get for these uh, and we can consider that configuration A will get this particular range running from maybe one in the worst case to four in the best case. Uh, but configuration B will run from six to eight, for instance, we can see that configuration A will never do better than configuration B, even in its best, even in the best uh, environmental conditions. So in that case, we can eliminate the adaptation to, con to configuration A entirely and not even con consider it when we're looking at our runtime adaptations. Uh, so the way we do this, just a quick overview of our approach, you can read more about it in the paper, is we start with two different models of the system. Uh, a structural model that we have written in Alloy and a behavioral model in uh, a model that is a stochastic multiplayer game in Prism. We take these models and first we uh, do some model checking, some bounded model checking on the Alloy model to generate all of the configurations that would be reachable within our time horizon and based on the adaptations that, um, that are available at each step. And we use Prism to uh, a probabilistic model checker to generate a best case expected value and worst case for each optimization objective at each configuration. Um, so again, those are, are done by modeling the system as a game. And the best case is where the two players, the environment and the system collaborate to get the best score. The worst case is when they are competing. Uh, those three values then we use a, what's called a possibilistic analysis to find essentially a weighted minimum of which one of those uh, we can look at. And we call this the potential value for each objective and each configuration. So using the reachability graph and the potential values, we do a Pareto optimization to eliminate any of the adaptations that are dominated by other adaptations that could also be taken from each configuration. And that resulting trimmed adaptation space can then be used to guide the runtime adaptation of the system. So we evaluated this system uh, by answering two research questions. First, we wanted to see how well our tool, which we call Thallium, um, performs in actually reducing the runtime adaptation space. First in sort of its offline mode and then how that reacts uh, when you actually try it at runtime. 
We also wanted to make sure that we weren't reducing the utility of the system because we're eliminating adaptations here and we don't want to make the system worse by having done so. So for our first experiment, we compared thallium to the state-of-the-art proactive latency aware approach on two systems, one called SWIM, which is a simulator of web infrastructure, and a second called DART, which is a simulation of uh, a team of autonomous drones flying over a hostile environment. Um, so we looked at different weightings here for how we can uh, create the potential value. And as you can see, the difference in the weightings doesn't matter a whole, a whole lot. Uh, each weighting seems to be roughly consistent. Um, and we did reduce the size of the, the reachability adaptation graph that we would consider at runtime uh, quite significantly. In the case of SWIM, we reduced it by an average of 63%. And for DART, we reduced it by an average of 22%. Um, for the second experiment, we ran each of those two systems, SWIM and DART, um, both using the uh, PLA, um, proactive latency aware state of the art approach, and using Thallium to see what the, re, what the runtime um, effect is on the system. So in this case, we instrumented each of the systems to, to tell us how many comparisons were made between states at runtime in order to make each adaptation decision. Uh, in this case, we reduced it by about half for SWIM by um, cutting it down from around 99,000 to about 48,000 um, total adaptation decisions uh, as the time went on in the simulation. We also tracked the cumulative utility, um, as sort of an overall metric as, how, um, as to how well the system was doing. And we ended up slightly higher than, than the uh, state-of-the-art approach in this case, although we didn't do a, any sort of statistical analysis on that one. Um, similarly for DART, the drone system, we we had 34% fewer um, comparisons between states as we were running the, the simulation a thousand times. And again, a slightly higher cumulative utility overall. Um, so in summary, uh, we were able to, to demonstrate a new way to reduce the runtime adaptation decision space offline and reduce the load on the runtime processor. And we do this with a combination of two different kinds of formal models. Um, first, the structural model to generate the reachability graph, and then the probabilistic model to, um, to generate the best and worst case bounds. And we combine those using some, uh, some techniques in, from possibility theory. Uh, the results were that we got a, between a 30 and a 50% reduction in work in the systems we tested without actually sacrificing any utility. So for future work, we would like to look at some other ways to, uh, other heuristics we could use or other ways to do the analysis. Maybe instead of the Pareto analysis, we can do something different. Um, or compare some of the knee solutions to get a more overall picture of what we're doing. Um, and we would like to thank the uh, National Science Foundation for their support and thank all of you for listening. And thank I'll take you very questions. much for the presentation. We have a question, which is in the evaluation, how big is the configuration space and where do the parameters come from used for making the decisions? So the configuration space in both of these um, I don't have exact numbers on how large these configuration spaces were, but we, uh, it's all dependent upon the, the number and the cardinality of the attributes you can have. So I think in the SWIM um, simulator for the web infrastructure, we had two, we had actually three um, different settings that you could, you could use. Um, the number of servers, the percentage of content, uh, and I believe there was one other knob that you could turn to adjust the, uh, um, you could adjust the, the, the thresholds for when it, um, when it added a new server. Um, and so for each of these, I think we, had, we, we actually increased them compared to other studies. Um, so we were looking at uh, lots of different configurations um, at each time, especially using a time horizon of 10 steps into the future, because it sort of increases um, multiplicatively the further back you go. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in order to get exact numbers, I would have to look look that up again. Uh, I don't have that information at hand, um, but we would like to be able to test it on larger configurations as well. In this case, for uh, mostly for, for time constraints, we were uh, limited to sort of smaller problems. Right. Thank you very much again. And we can now move to the last talk of this uh, session titled Exploring Differences and Commonalities Between Feature Flags and Configuration Options by Jens Meineke, Chu Kwan Wong, Bogdan Vasilescu, and Christian Kessner. I think Christian will present. Come. 
In this talk, we're going to talk about the differences and the commonalities between feature flags and configuration options. Feature flags are a hot topic, especially in industry. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around this, and when talking to practitioners, we heard complaints and problems with them and whether we could help them. But they also seem very similar to configuration options, which have been researched for a long time in software product lines and configurable systems. So we wanted to understand differences more and try to explore this phenomenon closer. So what are feature flags? Essentially, they're just these Boolean uh, conditions uh, picking between two different code paths somewhere in the implementation. Here's an example where, depending on whether the um, option for show big checkout button is activated for a specific user, we show one or the other code path. And this is used for all kinds of things. It's very common for A-B experiments where you show different outputs to different users and see which one performs better. But it can also be used for canary releases where you incrementally roll out features to more and more users. And it's also very common for trunk-based development where you don't want feature branches, but you want all developers to complete, uh, commit code changes to the master branch. And then if you want to commit incomplete code changes or things that haven't been fully tested, you need to hide them from other developers to not interfere. So you use feature flags for this as well. And finally, feature flags are also used for some configuration decisions. So the previous study on uh, feature flags that we found uh, looked at, the, um, at Chrome and uh, how they use feature flags in their development. And they actually reveal a number of feature flags as options to end users. If you find the setting, you can uh, change quite a few experimental features. So feature flags are something that's very broadly discussed in blog posts and in comments and in talks at practitioner conference. And there are actually startups around this, like LaunchDarkly and Split.io, that essentially offer Boolean options as a service. But again, we wanted to understand what's actually happening here. And first we thought about studying this in open source, but this seems to be more an industry practice. We actually had a bet within the research team whether uh, we would find any uh, open source project beyond Chrome that would use feature flags. I lost that bet. We actually found quite a few, and we had an MSR paper about this, and I uh, paid dinner for my colleagues. Um, but we really wanted to understand this more. And especially with my background in software product lines and configurable systems, a lot here seemed really familiar. So for example, I've studied for many years the Linux kernel and its configuration option, which has thousands of configuration options at compile time and also more at runtime. There's been a lot of work on kind of studying this, analyzing this, documenting this, uh, testing this kind of thing. So we wanted to understand how they are different. So our research question really is, what are the differences between feature flags and configuration options? What can we learn about them? With our background in configuration options, we were particularly interested in feature flags. So we studied gray literature and also talked to quite a few um, uh, developers in industry who develop uh, frameworks for this, who use feature flags and so on to, uh, to learn more. In our paper, we have lots of differences and discussions and structure this based on what we're finding. I just want to show you a few highlights. First of all, we found different goals of using feature flags. The ones I've shown you earlier, trunk-based development, experimental code paths, um, and configuration decisions. And we think it's worth to distinguish these as groups because they are used for quite different things. Some feature flags are used for configuration options, and they're actually quite similar to traditional notions of configurable systems and configuration options. But other feature flags for trunk-based development, A-B testing, and canary releases are quite different. They usually don't have a long lifespan, or they're not intended to. Uh, the developers are in control, or operators are in control of using them, and there are lots of differences when it comes to managing them, thinking about them, and tooling about them, that we think, and we have several of these recommendations, but we think clearly labeling the goal and distinguishing different kinds of flags is actually really beneficial. The lifespan is actually one of the key distinguishing characteristics here, and something that's new compared to the product line rule. In product lines, we have essentially given up ever getting rid of features. Some end users might still use them. We might want to use them later. Uh, it's very rare that you see them removed. For feature flags, a lot of people at least still have hope 
and push for this and discuss this as technical debt. And there's actually mechanisms and lots of opportunities to really document um, expectations about lifetime and conditions and have some tooling and some automation in the process. Actually, speaking briefly again about our other paper, we found that flag ownership actually corresponds to shorter lifespan. So I think there's lots of opportunity to study good practices here. But at the same time, I think there's also lots of things that we can learn from configurable systems for the feature flag community. For example, the product line community has developed a lot of formalisms about describing options and their dependencies and documenting them, feature models and things like this. Here's an excerpt from the Linux kernel. And I think this is something that the feature flag community often ignores. Um, and several um, of our interviews talked about possible opportunities for improvement there. Also, there are lots of analyses techniques in the research literature on configurable systems, for example, tracking options through the source code, which might also help with removing them and understanding their impact and testing them. And also for testing, there's a lot of work like combinatorial testing, which surprisingly none of our interviewees was familiar with, uh, which is a very powerful technique with very few configurations to test interactions among many options. And I think there's a lot of potential here to explore some of these mechanisms to try them also for feature flags. So in general, we looked at feature flags and configuration options, and we found that they're clearly not the same. They're clearly distinguishing differences, and we should not just um, equate them and use the same tools for both of them. But I think there's also a lot of potential for transfer of knowledge and tools between these two communities. Um, we're not saying that you should just adopt the configuration option tools or the feature flag tools for everything, but there are clearly differences and commonalities here and opportunities for sharing. And you find what may more examples of this in the paper together with interview results and eight of our recommendations. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, one question that we have is if you can elaborate on the food you have shown, <laughs> the food that you showed when you lost your bed. Uh, <laughs> sure, that's a Polish restaurant in Pittsburgh that we went to. Um, not sure. On, <laughs> on a more serious note, I would like to ask whether You've seen evidence that the feature flags as used are configuration options or the opposite. I would expect that their functionality allows them, allows each of the tool to be used for the other purpose, no? Can you repeat this? I'm not sure I understood the question. Yes, uh, whether you have found uh, evidence of whether you have heard from interviews of somebody using configuration option as a feature flag or a feature flag as a quick and dirty way to provide a configuration option. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very common to just mix them both. Um, so people use feature flag frameworks and then start using them for configuration options, for example, and just intermix them for both purposes. Um, and some of them should be removed and some of them stay. Um, there's also places where people use configuration libraries. I mean, they're technically very, they're <coughs> very similar. And it, it, in a sense, just if statements in the source code, right? And then some library to load them. Um, so we saw this a lot, um, especially at the at the tooling level that this is intermixed and people use them, mix them, use them for both. Another question that we have from the audience is how could configuration options benefit from the state of the practice on the future flags? I understand the benefits in the opposite direction. So we had a talk earlier about uh, removing um, feature flags uh, at Uber, right? So this is a kind of tool that would also be very useful for removing configuration options if you ever want to do that. Um, there are certain configuration options also that are under the control of um, the developer. Um, so this is mostly true for feature flags and it's true for some configuration options, sometimes in product lines. If you can do this, you have a lot of power about removing them, about controlling them. So I think there's a certain mindset that might also be influential kind of thinking about this if you're building product lines and things like this. There are a couple of examples of this in the paper as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One other question you have is, what is the most impressive lesson that feature flag community could learn from highly configurable systems community? 
So I come always back to um, combinatorial testing. I think this is a super cool result kind of from the software engineering community about how you can test interactions among thousands of, conf uh, of configuration options like pairwise interactions with something like 20 configurations you can cover 2000 different op Boolean options, right? So this is something that's very counterintuitive, but super powerful. And I think this is something that would be super easy to adopt um, if people just know about it and care about interactions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I have a question. Have you seen a bifurcation between systems that use either configuration options or feature flags, but not both? So are there many systems that use both or people decide that their product suits more like configuration style or feature flag style? Yeah, again, I, I don't think that most people distinguish them very well, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they use one or the other term and use them for, especially feature flags are often used for configuration options. They're also sometimes called business toggles um, and then they essentially configuration options versus deployment toggles. Um, I suspect you see also this is another thing like logging frameworks and configuration frameworks. A lot of systems just use a lot of different frameworks and different parts of the system for different purposes. And I would expect very much the same here that um, people adopt different strategies uh, for different parts for different questions. Um, but we, we didn't go too much into those topics mm -hmm. in our interviews. Um, uh, this brings us to the end of this uh, talk, to, to the end of the session on dependencies and configuration. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your future meeting. Bye bye.